Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Do you guys know the parable of the workers in the vineyard? Jesus says the workers in the vineyard all receive all pay. It means it doesn't matter whether you've just come to this or whether you've been doing this for decades. You get your pay. You get your inheritance. You get your reward. You're included. You're one with God. You're in the process of salvation. Therefore, you are in salvation. This chapter of it, if you think of salvation as a process, this chapter of it, this awakening is simply a shift in perception, a shift from duality where we see things as good and bad to where we look beyond the illusion of the forms of things, good or bad, and just see what is. Now, that's a determination. That's an acceptance of something that's already been given you internally. If you want to look at that as the awakening of the third eye, um, that's fine. I don't care how you relate to it. But it's an activation. Okay. There's a process and an activation. The process would be pointless without something that could occur to show you that the truth of the process was being um, played out in you, okay? And your activation is that, the fact that you're beginning to react to the words on the page, to the frequency, and remember, it's not about the words, to the frequency of truth that is presented through these words, through this teaching, Okay. This teaching is no different to any other teaching. Its only purpose is to save time. You could just as easily sit by a riverbank and have a full revelation, be washing the dishes and have a full revelation. Or you could be reading this course and have a full revelation. It doesn't matter. Something occurs in the mind and when the time for you to awaken is the time for you to awaken. It will occur. Until then, we are active in the vineyard. We are active in the process because the process, in this case, which saves time, brings the alpha and the omega together where I am. Okay. The alpha being the beginning of time and the omega being the end. If you were to pursue this linearly in a, in a horizontal sense along a timeline, it could take you billions of years. Prior to the advent of the course, we didn't really have the technology with which to understand that time is a construct that not only have I made it for myself, but which is also entirely flexible. It's also entirely usable. So we're learning to use time to our advantage. We're learning to use time for a purpose that is not only um, something that helpful within the world, but also um, directing our attentions out of the world, off planet, <laughs> outside of the frame of our conceptual understanding, okay? where God will take the last step himself and raise me up to him, raise you up to him, just as Donna read. Until then, we're bringing both things in, both things in, both things in. And we're doing that by looking at our cycles. All right, we're looking at our triggers, which are indicators of our blocks. Okay, the triggers themselves, you could be running around the planet for a thousand years trying to heal the things that trigger you. Heal what they represent. Heal what they represent. The things that show up on the time space platform as relationships that either you think you like them or you think you don't like them. 
Either way, that's a trigger, the good or the bad. Your path is a peaceful one. Your path is inner peace. Well, there's Wendy. All right. Your path is the middle path. If you were to look into Buddhism, the middle path, it's peaceful. The course is about allowing you a modality or allowing you the manipulation within your own time space framework, the manipulation of, or the reinterpretation would be better of attack defense mechanisms so that you can learn to stay in a peaceful place and become the master of inner peace in your own domain. Not bad, not good, all right? The things in the world that you think you like, that you call good, are just the yin-yang flip side of the things you think you don't like. And you can't have one without the other. They all end in a six-foot hole with a pine box. Salvation is the only one that does not end according to the dictates of the world, according to the dictates of the ego. All right? Yes. <laughs> the path of salvation that we're joining in here has to be active. There's no point studying this course endlessly. It's about putting it into practice. And the practice that we are putting it into through our willingness to forgive is the actual taking of the journey into fear, the actual taking of the journey into the dark. It's like we're the craziest people on earth. Who would really want to do that willingly? But yet look around, here we are, doing it for ourselves, doing it for our brothers, so that those who follow might find it easier. Their labour in the vineyard, might be less intense. The more that awaken, the more that awaken. It's like in this little group, you have no idea of how beneficial to the world your efforts are. I understand that you still seem to be somewhat self-concerned and self-obsessed about what's going on for me and my a sense of self, even, even in the false self. That's part of it. Eventually, you'll transcend all of that and your concern will only be for the whole. Your concern will only be for the greater good. Initially, we tend to parry off the greater good against what we think the greater good is but by our ability to perceive a greater good occurring in our own timeline, in our own experience of ourselves. That's part of it. But the mind is always, God is always giving. There is always more. The mind is always continuing to open, continuing to open, continuing to open. And eventually it opens up to the whole in a way where there's no concern of the individual self. There is only the nature of the expression of the divinity of true self, of higher self, but for now, we content ourselves with these lessons. We content ourselves with where we find ourselves, not trying to be further ahead than where we're at, not worrying about what things might look like next week or tomorrow, learning to stay present, learning to stay uh. <laughs> in the here and the now. And that's... Funnily enough, a process of forgetting to stay in the here and now because our minds are of the forgetting. We are learning to use our forgetting to enable us to learn how to remember better. Does that make sense? Donna says no. <laughs> the action of forgetfulness in our mind should be the reminder to remember you are training yourself that in your moments of mind wandering and absent mindedness to bring yourself back to the here and the now to the I am to the God is whatever you want to use in that singular place it doesn't really matter to the Ronald McDonald is that a bit sacrilegious so 
<laughs> it doesn't really matter though. It's like it's a singular thought. In that singular place in you, you'll find peace. And then, of course, because of the rapidity of uh, egocentric thinking, you'll find that you get distracted again and again, this way and that way and this way and that way. Wendy, are you driving to uh, Tina's house? You all loaded up there. You look happy. You look. You look like you're ready to. You're on a road trip. <laughs> So you're included in salvation. There's nothing to worry about as far as that part goes, all right? You can't get it wrong like we were saying yesterday. If, if you guys haven't watched yesterday's one, I suggest you watch it. There was a little addendum I wanted to add to something yesterday and now I can't remember. But anyway, um, you don't have to worry about salvation. Salvation is not up to you. All right, it's offered to you. It's already a complete whole thing. The part that is up to you is the willingness to do the work, okay, which is kind of like repeating what we were talking about yesterday, the willingness to do the work, which is, of course, forgiveness. Not that you need it because you're a child of God, but because your mind is plagued with ideas of guilt and doubt and fear and all of these things that you've picked up along the way in your journey of the soul, um, you have to be purified of all that stuff. You have to be willing to return your mind to God as it was given to you, free of all nonsense, all miscreative thinking, which might seem quite a daunting task. But remember, you're entitled to miracles. Right? You are entitled to miracles, and prayer is the medium of miracles. Prayer is the medium of miracles, which is hard to remember when you find yourself in the fluster of, uh, you know, an emotional meltdown or a midlife crisis. It's hard to remember that prayer is the medium of miracles, which is why you need mind training. Okay, mind training, not I can work this out. I've got this. It's got to be miraculous. You're learning to become miracle minded. You're learning to be whatever Trevor. You're learning to be fuck it bucket. You're learning to be let go and let God. You're learning to be keep it simple, stupid. All of those simple little, you know, indicators or uh, what do you call them? Um, references. You're learning to be all those things, not to understand them and whatever, but to actually be the living embodiment of those things on earth. Jesus says, be a passerby, okay? And like the caveat to that, of course, is the Samaritan. If you see somebody struggling and having a hard time, obviously help them out. Don't just sort of like... <laughs> so your part is forgiveness. And it's not even a part that's difficult. It's only a willingness to forgive, a little willingness. Right? But you'll be surprised when Jesus says it's a little willingness, you'll be surprised how reluctant you are to forgive. Or maybe you're not surprised. Maybe you can already see it. But Tina's nodding her head. I see that. The reluctance is to forgive yourself for the world you think you made. The reluctance is to forgive yourself for not only the the shitty things in the world that you think really upset you but the things you think you love because that's not love family friends grandchildren children all of these things they're huge triggers huge teachers the last thing that you will probably process in your own transformation is your thoughts about children because they do represent an innocence. They do represent a divinity. And it's not until their egos begin to kick in when they're like uh, eight or nine years old that you really start to, you know, those rat bag kids. <laughs> until then, they're perfect little angels. And, oh, aren't they beautiful? Even when they smash your mother's great-grandmother's vase. Oh, look at that. <laughs> There's nothing to forgive there until that ego kicks in 
And then that's the ego that I make. You understand that? That's the ego I give them. They don't have one. They're a child of God. The only reason I can see ego in another is because I'm not accepting the fact that I'm coming from that place in my own mind, that I'm using that way of seeing as a process of um, justifying an identity that is false. I'm spirit, not flesh. Children are spirit, not flesh. And I, I have a beautiful little story. Um, I'll just offer you this one. Beautiful. This is probably one of my most beautiful little stories, and it's my, my little children's story. Um, when I was at the healing center, we had a lunch room. So when Ted had finished teaching or whoever was, to, usually Ted, but whoever was teaching for the day, we would go and have lunch. And there was some days there was like 150 people there and the Bay Marie would be like piled up with pasta or it was always vegetarian. And there'd be a huge queue. So sometimes rather than wait in the queue, some of us would go and sit over in the, in the lounge area and just wait on the lounges until the queue had gone down a bit and then go and get something to eat. And this day I was sitting on the, um, like a three-seater bamboo lounge, you know, with cushions and stuff with a couple of other guys. And uh, down behind on the floor playing with whatever they were playing with was two little children one of about two years old and uh, one of about three years old, maybe a little, a little older than that. And the older one, we were watching them unbeknownst to them. We were looking over the back of the couch, watching what they were doing. And the older one turned to the younger one and said, can you remind me what God is? I'm beginning to forget. And that, that moment melted my heart. That moment, like they had no clue we were watching they know it was just a total moment, a total beautiful moment. And it pinpoints perfectly that descent or that, you know, into, into humanity. It's like there's really this transition point. And it's like Jesus says in the Bible, lest you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Those children are innocent of judgment completely innocent of judgment. It's not innocent of judgment in the way that they're guilty of judgment or anything like that, but innocent as in they don't even know what that is. They don't even have a concept for judging, for judgment. They're totally in the moment, totally present. Except for my daughter. <laughs> when my daughter, here's another funny little story. When my daughter was two, Right. This is how the ego, the ego is always on projecting, projecting, projecting. When my daughter was two, she had a few sentences, a few little things she could say. Um, you know, daddy want food and things, you know, like little children do. And I would tuck her in every night. And one night I went in um, to her bedroom to tuck her in and I kissed her good night. And I said, good night, baby. And uh, we had a little sing song and, and good night, baby. And then she said, dad, I've got something, you know, come here, like called me over. And then this weird voice came out of her, like, like a deep, dark voice and said, I hope you burn in hell. That was, it was bizarre, right? It was a total out of sequence thing. She didn't even know those words. Okay. She didn't even know those words. And you'll have, mo <laughs> I know it's funny, you'll have moments like that where things throw you for a six. And that shook me for weeks. That shook me. I, I talked to my wife and we sat there with it. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> and it was like weird stuff, right? So weird stuff happens. But it's still all included in salvation. Oh, I've got a little dingo dog running around out there. It's my friend, my friend's dog, actually. I don't know if you can see it there. It's a it's a cross. It's a it's a dingo cross something else. Oh, she's just found my old dog's bone. There you go. Distraction. So um in the in salvation, you'll have these like markers, you'll have these moments, like Anthea's just had a moment. 
right? So you'll have these moments where things occur to you that are totally unexpected, totally out of the blue, that all represent salvation in one way or another. One of my greatest fears I ever had was burning in hell when I used to used to look for um, uh, reason and purpose through religious, um, you know, religious sort of uh, outreaches and things like that. But uh, before my enlightenment, I was going in and out and in and out and in and out of temples and mosques and synagogues, you name it. I went pretty much everywhere that I could looking for something that made sense. And uh, the Baptists really put the fear of, uh, well, maybe it was the Anglicans, but they put the wind right up me with this burning in hell thing. And my fear of it was projected out onto my tiny little daughter who didn't even know those words. And it wasn't even her voice. It was a given voice and I had to look at that whole idea. And I remember going to Ted to talk about it once and uh, Ted used to live in a house, he, he, in a house down the road from the healing centre um, at, a, at, a, at a time and then he moved to the healing centre by request. But um, when he lived in the house, he would wander home and... Uh, quite often he would be plagued <laughs> plagued by course students who would follow him home and want to sort of ask him questions and just sit around all day and just shoot the breeze. He didn't mind that. He gave himself completely willingly to that. But uh, I always thought that was a bit of a, an intrusion on his, on his space. You know, he's trying to make himself some lunch or whatever. He never ate at the thing. But one day I felt I really had to go down there because of a dream I've had about burning in hell and uh, like all of these things. And so it's like come around to this fulfillment point where a cycle of belief representing a total belief in denial shows up for me. You know, you guys are going to have the same thing. Learning to identify those triggers, learning to identify those cycles is literally um, your own individual doorway in salvation. And usually they're very obvious. Usually they arouse a deep-seated emotion or they're um, so completely off whack that you're like, what the hell? You don't know what to do with it, right? And the closer you get to the light, the more off whack they become, all right? The closer you get to God or the closer or the higher your frequency becomes, the crazier shit seems to happen, all right? Because we're exiting out of this narrow band of time and space where we see, hear, smell, touch, taste, and think about all those things to a boundless and limitless um, view of not only the universe and ourselves, but God. Right. In that, all of those fringe ideas, all of that fringe thinking that we try to so desperately not look at the weird stuff, it comes up. Right. There is nothing. Uh, what's that saying? There's nothing hidden that will not be unhid or something or will not be exposed. Absolutely. Every single little fear, every single little jot and tittle will be accounted for. And the closer you get to God, the more you're in this. It's like right now you're being tangibly exposed to things that um, make sense to you, okay? But really, what makes sense about time and space? We think things make sense compared to other things that don't make sense. But then all of a sudden you start to really look at it honestly. It's like none of it really makes sense. My ideas of even love, as I think love should be for me, don't make sense. They all fail me. And so we start to go uh, into the twilight zone of our consciousness, right, with faith, and we encounter these more insidious or darker manifestations of, uh, of our thinking, which show up as these kind of weird little out-of-time moments. And some of them are... Some of them are um, particularly pleasant and some of them are particularly just what the hell? You don't know what to do with them. But in all of these things, it's like miracle mindedness. Okay. 
if you try to remember that everything is just energy, everything is just dark light being released to the, the true vibration of light being let go, right? You're releasing that inner light, that Christ light. If you can remember that, then you'll be able to remember to be still and just let that energy come up. Just let it happen. It doesn't matter what the triggers and the catalysts are. It can be some weird satanic stuff from your kid or it can be beautiful stuff from little kids who we like to look upon as the most innocent of our creative miscreations, <laughs> if that makes sense. Or it can be an absolute night terror. It doesn't matter. It's just energy, right? Try to think of everything as that so that you become the passerby and you sort of break that bond with reacting to the figures and the imagery in the dream and simply go internally with it where the reaction itself is what you are processing, all right? Not what you're reacting to. It's the fact that you even still have a reaction, that you are not the passerby yet, all right? So as we purify our thinking, purify our thinking, purify our thinking, and everything becomes whatever Trevor, right? Everything becomes just put it in the fuck it bucket. All of these things are useful, all right? So in our forgetting Donna, we learn to remember better, all right? But the mind training is to help us to remember, to apply the principles of this teaching, the principles of this course to what it is we think upsets us and Jesus says, I will help you even more, even if you give me the thoughts that you think make you happy. All right? All of your beautiful and loving thoughts are saved for you in eternity because of what they are. Beautiful and loving. Not the way they manifest in time and space, but the energy of them, the beauty and the loving. But eventually you have to let the whole lot go. You have to forgive the entirety of the world and let the whole lot um, be released into the light. It's like, all right, it's time for me to go. It's time for me to wake up from this dream, the good and the bad, because all of my definitions only verify the dream and keep me in it. I've got to let go of both sides, both the yin and the yang. I don't want the yin or the yang anymore. I see that neither one of those things is helpful to me if the pursuit of inner peace is dependent upon um, the release of all temporal association. And that will bring your alpha and your omega right to where you are in the here and the now. Okay. So for each of you, you all have situations. You all have relationships at work, at home, with family, friends, and everything. Those are the lessons that are presented to you. There's never a moment that you're in someone else's company by accident. There's never a moment that you're not somewhere on purpose. There's no coincidences in this. None. You can try to convince yourself there is. You can try to convince yourself that you're more spiritually superior or advanced or whatever, whatever. It's like, uh-uh. Every relationship is offering you something that you need. Every relationship is offering you a reflection a reflection. What do I see in this mirror? What do I see in this person, this situation, this event? And that's where you have to be honest. When we do our lessons in the 20-minute book, that honesty looks like feeling. Honesty is a concept, is nothing. You know, the, the most honest of men are still liars and the sons of liars. But when you feel something, you can't lie about that. You cannot escape how you feel emotionally, All right? That's your true place. If you're looking in your head for thoughts that tell you whether you're being honest or not, that's not a true place. You've been deceiving yourself from the beginning. <laughs> You've been a liar from the start. But when you connect, when you feel where you're at, that's honest. Right? To thyself be true. The mind makes the decision and the heart, which is that emotional place, you know, where we just want to love and be loved. 
right? The ego interprets those emotional um, impulses incorrectly, okay? The ego interprets the sexual impulse incorrectly. It's actually a miracle impulse. I'm not saying don't have sex. We need babies because like other souls have to come in and there's things like that. But that ego mind, that mindset that's always looking for the external validation is going to interpret miracle impulses as impulses for the gratification of the physical nature of things. And sex is probably about its most useful tool. You know, who doesn't love a good orgasm or, uh, or uh, the game leading up to it? You know, that whole, that whole catch me if you can kind of, it's like, that's great. But that's the exact reflection of the nature of the relationship that you're having and playing out with God. Catch me if you can. God is the orgasm of all orgasms. <laughs> it's beyond. You couldn't even, you can't even imagine it. It's like it's an ever increasing, ever. Not that, uh, not that it's an orgasm, but that revelation, that ecstasy, that rapture. It's like there are no real words to describe what's being offered to you. We do our best with the feeble nature of communication that we have here. But luckily, Jesus has brought this course to us so that we can enter into a whole new paradigm of communication, a whole new way of beginning not only to relate to each other as equals, but to begin to um, connect in an out-of-time way. Okay? We're going through this purification process now. We're going through this undoing now. We're looking at our thought system, realizing how erroneous it is and how meaningless it is and making decisions again and again and again to let go, let go, let go, let go. Right? We're doing the hard work now. Okay, Miracles are your right, but purification is necessary first. At a certain point, something is going to shift in your consciousness and you're just going to be able to enter into light directly. But that takes total devotion, total dedication. It's not a part-time pursuit. It's your life. It's every relationship you have. You've got to see this as the, the worst blunder you've ever made. <laughs> and it's your responsibility to heal the blunder, to clean up your mess. It doesn't stop. There's not an end to this spiritual path, if you, if you want to call it that, because it's an action of mind. It's an action that's continually releasing the past and letting go of the future, releasing the past and letting go of the future, living in the beauty and the presence of here and now, where you can only become aware of life. You can only become aware of the flow of love in you and through you. You can't be aware of it wondering what it's like. That mind we're letting go of. You can't become aware of it trying to imagine what it could possibly be. That mind we're letting go of. We're stepping into a clean space, a space where we refuse to listen to that voice that distracts us. We refuse to, to listen to that and we stay there. That's all this is. It's so simple. But because we've made everything so very complicated for ourselves, we have to be led to truth by our own complicated way. <laughs> if I told you how simple it was at the beginning, you'd be like, no, nah, <laughs> not this guy. It's so simple. You're that already. You are already perfect. You are already whole. Now live from that without trying to decide what that ought to look like. Live from that without deciding how it is you should be validated or received. Live from that knowing that don't expect any better treatment than Jesus got. <laughs> Luckily, crucifixion is outlawed in almost all countries of the world now. But don't expect that you won't be seen as the black sheep of your own family. A prophet is never welcome in their own home.
Mm. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. Accepting God's love, accepting God's love when God says he loves you. Right? God, God doesn't have an actual voice. Jesus calls it in the, in the course, the voice for God, right? Or if you're old school, you can call it the Metatron. It's got a kind of a, you know, trans, a science fiction sort of the Metatron, the voice for God, right? But that voice resounds within you. We're learning in the here and now to listen. We're learning to listen. And listening is where we, we're getting to. Listening is, inner listening is, um, God will speak to you and tell you that he loves you. And you're not going to know what to do with that. Until you're ready, that's going to make you feel more unworthy than it will bring up everything. It's like a tolling bell. It'll resound throughout every dark chasm and every nook and cranny that you've got. It doesn't seem to upset you too much when I tell you I love you. <laughs> Even though I know what that means in my own mind. But when God tells you that's going to be, the shit's going to hit the fan. <laughs> The reality of that is more than the condensed entity of uh, the avatar association you find yourself in can take. You have to be prepared. You have to be, when God speaks to you directly and says, I love you, my son, that's going to shatter every illusion you have about yourself. It's going to bring everything to the surface. When you hear that voice, you'll know. You'll know who speaks it. You'll know where it comes from. It'll be as natural to you as the voice of uh, the person you know the best in this world. It'll just be like, oh, that's so-and-so. You'll hear God's voice and you'll be like, oh, that's God. <laughs> because no time has passed. You believe you exist in time. You believe you exist within a framework of beginnings and endings. None of that is true. There's only ever the beautiful now where God is. No time has passed in eternity. None. You have not stopped listening to God's voice. You have never ceased to accept his love and to extend it limitlessly. It's only the false belief in self that allows you to believe that it's possible that that could even have occurred. But it hasn't. But until you recognize it hasn't yourself, you've got 365 lessons. <laughs> You got a Zoom meeting and whatever else, whatever else it is you guys do. I know some of you guys uh, have other teaching and learning formal sort of things as well, which is cool. Try to get a sense of that inner listening when you do your meditation. At the moment, like everything in this is a transition. Everything is crossing the bridge between the worlds, and things change, and you have to allow them to change you'll kind of become aware of the changes because you'll have things that we call shifts in consciousness, which will leave you in a very confused state for a few days, usually three or four days. And you'll be like, what's going on? I thought I was starting to get a grip on this and now I'm all over the place. Right. But allow those shifts to occur. You will experience confusion every time there's a shift, just keep going. All right. Because the shifts are going to take you from externalizing the nature of the relationship you have with God 
as fragmented and individual amongst a multiplicity of relationships to an internal one where you recognize and truly adhere to the idea that you're processing everything inside, that everything is a reflection of one relationship that you have. Everything externally is a symbolic, relate, symbolic representation of the one relationship you have with God. If it's out of accord, if your relationship with God in you is out of accord anywhere, it'll show up in time and space. Not so you can be horrified, but so you can be still and allow the healing of what's out of accord in you to occur. And little by little, you'll transition to an internal frame of reference. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Okay? The kingdom of heaven is within you. You've tried to make a kingdom outside of yourself. You've tried to be flesh, but you are spirit. And we're transitioning from the flesh world, that external referencing to a kingdom within, which is beyond imagination, beyond corruption. And as you go within, you'll find that you become less concerned with forgiveness. All right. Forgiveness is where we're at right now. So stick to it. Don't try to jump ahead to what I'm talking about, but I just want you to know what I'm talking about. You'll become less concerned with forgiveness just automatically. And you'll become more concerned with listening, more concerned with listening. Right. And the later part of the workbook is all about um, listening we say god is and now we cease to speak and we listen for him who would tell us of our holiness and tell us of his love okay but that's a transition don't try to cram a whole transition into an understanding that you think you can nut and bolt right here and now but be aware that it is a transition and so when things seem to change when things seem to be not what they were yesterday just Allow yourself to understand that's perfect. Things have to change. I'm taking an internal journey here. This is not about being validated out in the world. The only validation that will ever fulfill you is God's. And what more could you want than that? <laughs> Tina's thinking about it. See how you had to stop and think about it? <laughs> give up the world and follow me yes lord but let me just go to the market and sell all my stuff <laughs> too late time waits for no man or well, the kingdom of heaven waits for no man what whichever one you want to use vinka how are you going yeah i'm going i've I've just been through some very, <laughs> very interesting reflective moments, if one could say that. And yep, one could say that. Yeah, You've got a bad yeah, connection there on the microphone. Could be. I'm, I, um, my internet is not that great here. No, we can um, tell. Where are you, down the road at... Um, are you out of Cameron's pocket? No, I'm in, at Homebush. I am sitting in my caravan. Okay. I am not on the road this morning. <laughs> okay. All right. And I'll get you to turn your microphone off. You're glitching in and out. Okay. Good. Let's just take a moment. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Breathe slowly in, slowly out. Oh, we've lost Wendy. Slowly in, slowly out. John, close your eyes. Breathe. Make a decision to let go of everything. 
everything that happened yesterday, everything that you expect or think or possibly could happen tomorrow. Breathe. Try to find a sense of the present in your mind, that place that you've given to the Holy Spirit. If you're doing the course properly, um, you'll understand it when I say that because Jesus asks you to invite the Holy Spirit in to abide with you for the duration of this, not just for the moment that you're reading those words, for the duration. That invitation for the Holy Spirit to come upon you has to be heartfelt, has to be conscious, has to be something that you're damn sure of, something that you know you have done. I have made that invitation. If you have to stop to think about it, then you haven't. If you're doubtful whether you've even made that invitation properly, then you haven't. Because in the making of that invitation is also the fulfillment of the promise. And in that, there is no doubt. What is of God leaves no room for anything other than what is of God. There is no doubt. There is no fear. There is no guilt. When you find that here and now, when you find that place, that's how it should feel. It should feel sacred. It should feel different to every other feeling you have. And I want you to breathe into that place. Breathe into the now and the here. The here and the now. Feel your breath. Feel it throughout your body. Sense the holiness of the moment. Feel the Holy Spirit in you because it is in you. Feel your body and stay grounded. Don't try to transcend it and go astral. Keep your eyes closed and breathe. <coughs> You find you get distracted from the here and the now, bring yourself back. If you have interfering thoughts, let them go and bring yourself back to the here and the now, this moment, this moment. This is where we're going to learn to communicate. This is where your mind will begin to open by itself. It's been waiting a long, long time to release the inner light. A long, long time for you to be willing to let go of the prisoner that you've made of God's son. In this place, here and now, we're saying, yes, I see it does me no good to hold God's son as prisoner in my mind. I see it does me no good to constantly choose against my own best interests. I see it does me no good to go against the flow, to try and paddle my own canoe. I'm going to throw my oars in the water and I'm going to let the current carry me where it will, trusting that it knows where it's going. That is the flow of the universe. You exist in that flow only in the here and the now. In the here and the now, is where life is actually happening to you. It's not happening to you yesterday. It's not happening to you in your thoughts about tomorrow. It's happening to you now. You can only connect with it now. Find that place in you, the here and the now. Feel it. <laughs> yes. Feel it. 
breathe into that place and out from that place. It doesn't matter if you think nothing's going on there. It doesn't matter if you think something else should be happening or maybe this or maybe that because of other experiences you've had. This is not that. This is something that we are choosing not to corrupt and we're going to wait. We're going to wait together in this place. If you find it particularly difficult to wait in this place without corrupting it, maybe you're not ready. Maybe there's more for required. Clearing away the blocks so that you can stay in this place, in the here and the now, and carry it with you throughout the day. Breathe. Yes. Good. We're not going to do a, a, a light session as such today. I just want you to try and find this place. Good, Catherine. That's good. It's a peaceful place. It's perfectly peaceful. No fear can intrude upon it. There is no pain and no suffering in this place. It's a place that's held sacred for you by the spirit. Think of it as a sanctuary, but you have to learn to stay in the sanctuary. You have to learn to be present place in this moment, fully awake, fully aware, fully present. Breathe. It's good, Anthea, good. Yes. It's kind of important that you don't um, put yourself into a, a reclining posture because uh, the tendency will be to fall asleep. <laughs> I know this from experience. <laughs> Jesus says, sit up. Sit up in a chair. Do these lessons. Do these exercises. Good. And practice finding that place throughout the day as well, away from the busy chit-chat of your own thoughts, away from the busy chit-chat of that endless, endless cacophony of ideas and meanings and judgments that you give to everything. Learn to make this place sacred, the here and the now. And you come here, to present yourselves to God, to listen. Just as with our circle, our gold circle, you come there to forgive. It's the same place, really. It's just transitioning from one thing to the next thing. You're going to go from the need to forgive, from that feeling of release, to a calm and peaceful place, the cool, long grass, the still waters of your mind. And that's where you're going to wait. There are many facets, if you like, to salvation. There are many actions. They're all the same action. It's an action of release and staying and being but there are many actions and the Holy Spirit, the action of the Holy Spirit in you will seem to change as you transition through things. And there may be the temptation to become fearful. What's happened to my connection? Why don't I feel how I used to feel? Right? Just remember, don't judge the form, apply the principle. Don't judge what seems to be occurring. Let it be miraculous. Breathe. Good. 
Be aware if you're distracted. Be aware if your thoughts wander. Breathe. Close your eyes. Focus. Focus. Don't become distracted. Listen. Listen. Be determined to hear. Listen. Breathe. Listen. Focus. Bring your mind back. Bring your mind back. Train your mind to stay here and now. We say God is, and then we cease to speak. You must refuse to listen to that voice. But wait in silent readiness.
More focus. Focus. Breathe. There is no pain in this place. There is no suffering. There is nothing but perfect peace. We leave the work behind us for a moment. We practice making our minds still and listening in readiness to him who speaks to us of our holiness, who speaks to us of our love for him. Listen. Listening is an action. Inner listening is an action. You are listening to the silence, listening to that inner emptiness, that inner space that you have given as devotion and dedication to God where the Holy Spirit abides. Listen. <laughs> yes. A little more. Focus. Everything is practice. Focus, listen, listen, listen into the darkness, listen into the void, listen into that silent place. What you perceive as fear or doubt, listen. The ego misinterprets the call. The ego corrupts every impulse. There is not a moment where God's voice ceases to call upon your forgiveness to save you, to call you to hear him speak of your holiness. These are the action of mind, the action of penitence. The action of repentance, the action of giving to God that which is of God's, which is you. Focus. Good. You'll come to your own conclusions about the transition from the block of learning that we call healing to the block of learning that we call listening. You'll come to your own conclusions about that and where you're at with that. You'll get a sense of things. You'll feel a sense of being guided with it. It's important that you practice listening to that guidance when you're out doing your shopping, when you're talking to your children, especially when you're talking to your children. It's important that you get a sense of practicing listening to the guidance. Listen, learn, and do. It's a surreal proposition. It's an unbelievable proposition to the ego mind that you are involved in such a thing as salvation. 
that it's active in you. The ego will always try to dumb it down to tell you that it's not what you think it is and that the things that speak for your truth don't really matter or maybe it's not so. That's its purpose. It will always do that. You are learning not to listen to that voice for doubt, not to listen for that voice of corruption. You're learning to listen in the still place, in the here and the now. That action of inner listening, the knee of listening, it's a skill. It's a skill that you will master through the mind training as you transition from the idea that you think you need forgiveness, that you think there actually could possibly be a block to the awareness of love's presence in you, to the place where that becomes so preposterous, <laughs> so nothing that your time will be spent in listening. But for now, we do the work. For now, we do the lessons. And we're still in the first half of the workbook. So we're going to apply those lessons diligently and vigilantly. And we're going to teach ourselves to remember through our forgetting. In the moment where we think we've forgotten to do our lesson, in the moment where we think we've forgotten to carry um, that representation of Christ, with us throughout the day, we apply the principle again. We forgive ourselves for that imagining. No time is passing. The here and the now, here we are. Right? Here we are back again in God. Here we are in this present moment. listening to that ego voice, listening to that voice that speaks of time, you, it's like it's a rabbit hole. It's very easy to go all the way to the bottom and get lost. We're going to the bottom with a guide, but we have to learn to listen to the guide. One day at a time, one step at a time, one lesson at a time, one moment at a time. There's nothing to fear. Any questions? You'll feel peaceful. Yeah. Can you feel a sense of peace. You look quite calm and peaceful. Good. In the present moment, there is only that peace. Right. Do the work. Every time you find yourself out of that present moment, out of that peace, do the work, forgive, look at it, look at what it represents in the relationship with your father, with your creator. The world and your thoughts about the world are a symbolic representation of the denial of your relationship with God. Learn to see it that way, learn to process it that way so that it can be reinterpreted as an altruistic view of the sonship, as an altruistic view of what it is that you're supposed to be about in the walking of this journey of salvation, which is love. <laughs> in case you forget. <laughs> love holds no grievances, no judgments. No questions? All good? Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for joining. I love you. <laughs>